Welcome everyone to the Science Lecture Series, and thank you for joining us for the second installment of the Science Lecture Series on COVID Conversations, how the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences at UC Riverside is combating the pandemic of our lifetime. My name is Catherine Eric, and I'm the Dean of the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences, or CNAS, here at UC Riverside. Before we proceed, I would like to take a few moments to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Kayui, Tongva, Luisagno, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. So today, this meeting place is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students, and staff. And we're grateful to have this opportunity to live and work on these homelands. So the science lecture series is a three-part series with our CNAS scientists who have responded to the pandemic in various ways, from creating a testing lab, which we heard about last week, to what we're gonna hear about today, conducting research on virology to understand viruses and the development of vaccines, to next week is we're gonna be investigating the assembly and reproduction of the coronavirus in the human body. So although the pandemic forced the campus to close down last year, that did not slow our faculty down one little bit. They all stepped up in a variety of ways to contribute to the campus community and to also contribute to the world around us in the area of COVID testing, vaccines, and better understanding of the virus. Um, the topic of the coronavirus is so critical and relevant. Everything is happening in real time as we're learning on a daily basis, weekly basis, sometimes hourly basis. And all of this, UCR science is at the forefront of the understanding in combating the coronavirus. So I wanna point out again, last week our presentation with Dr. Catherine Borkovich and Dr. Isqui Koloshan was on testing and creating a clinical testing lab on campus. Next week's presentation on Tuesday, April 20th, Dr. Roy Azandi and Dr. Thomas Coleman will share how their research and computer simulations Will, which have never been performed on the coronavirus will help propel the development of drug therapies that slow down or, or destroy the virus. So um, before I turn the program to, over to our moderator, Dr. Francis Sladek, I wanna take this opportunity to thank you for joining us this evening. I hope, actually, I know that you will enjoy this presentation on COVID, vaccines and beyond. I'm incredibly proud of the work that our faculty do to positively impact the lives of not just the UCR community, but our global community. So now I would like to introduce our moderator for tonight, Dr. Francie Sladek, who is the Divisional Dean of Life Sciences and a Professor of Biology, Cell Biology at UCR, Dr. Sladek. Okay, thank you, Dean Urick. I, uh, hold on, there we go. Thank you, Dean Urick for the introduction. And welcome everybody to the second installment of the science lecture series. Health, safety, and the return to our pre-pandemic lives are conversations that people are having all over the world. At the center of those conversations, of course, are the vaccines. So tonight's topic, as Dean York said, is COVID vaccines and beyond. These co topic, this topic or this series tonight will highlight the work of two leading researchers in CNAS with expertise in virology and the development of vaccines. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Juliet Morrison. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Microbiology and Plant Pathology here at UCR. She earned her BA in biology from Bard College and her PhD in microbiology from Columbia University. Professor Morrison's research combines methods in immunology and virology and computational analysis to to address questions at the host pathogen interface. I know these are a lot of words, but believe me, by the end of tonight, you'll understand things a little bit better. A major focus of the Morrison Lab is to understand how emerging and re-emerging viruses antagonize the innate immune pathways to promote replication of the virus. And again, Professor Morrison's gonna tell us about innate immunity. Her lab also studies the dynamics of lung immune cell populations during influenza infections, i.e. the flu, as well as spleen and liver immune cell populations during dengue virus infections. The ultimate goal of her lab's research is to translate those findings into effective treatments. Our other speaker this evening, the second one, is Dr. Rong Hai, 
He's also an assistant professor in the Department of Microbiology and Plant Pathology. Professor High earned his doctorate in biochemistry at the University of California, Berkeley. His research seeks to elucidate the contributions of both viral and host determinants. And when we say host, that means us, the humans, on viral virulence, it just means how nasty the virus is, uh, associated with emerging human RNA viral pathogens. A lot more words, emerging human viral RNA pathogens, that's basically COVID-19. The ultimate goal of his research is to develop novel treatments as well, including therapeutics to fight the virus after you get it, and of course, vaccines before you get the infection. His lab currently works on influenza, Zika, and SARS-CoV-2 viruses, which is the cause of the COVID-19 pandemic. So, Ron, I'd like for you to start off the conversations this evening. Okay. First of all, thank you uh, for the kind of introduction. And let me uh, share my screen with... Okay. Uh, once again, uh, thanks, Dodd, uh, Dr. Salidic, for kind of introduction for uh, myself. It's really flattered. And also a kind of invitation from uh, CNS Dean to give me the chance or opportunity to talk about the topic here, list COVID vaccines and beyond. What we care about vaccines, why uh, when we talk about COVID, we talk about vaccines. So I want to draw your attention to the background of the slides, which is describe an emerging medical facility, treat 1918, which has happened 100 years ago, a 1918 pandemic, patients. And with the time move on, this is actually a so-called COVID hospital wow. treated COVID infected patient last year, early last year in Wuhan. So when we merge, when we move this side by side, this two picture together, you will get the impression say, science never move on. We only use the same efficient uh, treatment for the pandemic situation. However, reality is science with 100 year advancement did provide some powerful tools for us to deal with worrisome pandemic pathogen, which is today's uh, topic, which is vaccine. <clears throat> Before we go into the real science about vaccine, let me use an analogy about what's a vaccine like. Vaccine is like a truck loading a cargo which is sell to a host and allow the host to develop a system to deal with the later on the army of the viruses attack. So the real scientific name for cargo is actually in this case is a viral component. And the truck is actually so-called viral vaccine platforms. In this talk, I will introduce to you so what exactly the viral component we choose for COVID vaccine and what exactly vaccine platform we choose for this vaccine. So let's first thing first, start with a viral component for the COVID vaccine. The <clears throat> viral component we choose for the vaccine for COVID viruses is SARS viruses, uh, SARS protein. So why we choose that? Let me look at the one of the virus picture, what is the uh, virus look like. On your left hand side is a viral, is the viruses. Inside is RNA uh, <clears throat> genome, as a server as a genome. And move out, it's surrounded by NP protein, N protein, sorry, nuclear capsid protein protection. And move outside, it's a membrane. It's which developed from the cell hijacked from cell membrane. So on this located, the membrane, viral membrane, is two proteins. One is a membrane protein. It's a small, it's hided from another large one, which is a glyco S protein. It's a spike protein, a glyco protein, shortening S protein. S protein is reality, it's a trimer. So it's a three identical subunits form a complex. 
this complex perform one critical function for the viruses, which is guide the viruses go into the cell. In this way, you can imagine if our host develop a certain way to block this S protein function, make it dysfunctional. So which will abolish the virus capability to go into the cell. In such way, the viruses cannot make a damage to the cells. That's one of the major reason we choose S protein as a viral component in the vaccines. So then let's move on to the viral platforms. Before we dive in into the specific viral platform choose for SARS-CoV-2 viruses, let me introduce to you what's a commonly a platform available for us right now. Generally, they are contain inactivated, life attenuated, or protein subunit, or a virus like a particle, or virus vectored, or mRNA based, or DNA based. So totally among the different forms. Among these different vaccine platforms, three of them is actually common use for other viral pathogen or other disease. These are inactivated or life attenuated or protein subunits. However, at least for states, we choose rather a different route, a more dramatically or less used viral pla uh, vaccine platform, which is virus vector and MRI based. The reason behind one is because they're efficient to develop. Second, it's because there's a lesson we're learning from the vaccine development for one of the very similar viruses to the SARS-2 viruses, which is SARS-1 viruses, as described in this slide. This experiment was performed by Dr. Rothberg. What they do, they use inactivated SARS-1 viruses, twice vaccinated. Then after that, they challenge with the mice, with the live SARS-1 viruses. So based on the performance of the challenged animals, they can tell whether this platform is suitable for develop for SARS-1 viruses. So in reality, what they find, instead of induce a long-term or complete protection, they only find a short-lived or incomplete protection, even more worrisome. So the vaccine can induce inflammation in lungs in the mice, okay. which is, can cause a certain a concern whether this classic vaccine uh, platform may have some uh, advanced disability function effect in the vaccine development for SARS-2 viruses. That's why another consideration took us to develop the SARS-2 viruses vaccine with based on the two uh, platform, which is MRI-based and uh, antiviruses-based vaccine. So the current UA approved for COVID-19 vaccine for states, they are generally provided by uh, two, three uh, vaccine developer. One, Moderna, associated with NIH, Pfizer, BioNTech, and uh, Johnson Johnson. So as I mentioned, Moderna, Pfizer, they boast develop the platform is based on MRI based. So that's a liposomal nanoparticle encapsulated MRI, which is, you think about a lipid ball, rapid eyes, MRI insight. So the whole purpose for the protection. For Johnson Johnson, which is used as incomplete antiviruses based vaccine. So even though this is a new technique for vaccine field, However, vaccine field take very seriously for develop this vaccine for the SARS viruses. For both Moderna and Pfizer, which they start their phase three efficacy trial back in July 2020, last year. For the Johnson Johnson, a little bit following that, September 2020. So let's see in the following slide, I will dive in to share with some of the detailed component of the MRA-based vaccine, what it look like or what it contain. So the MRA-based two vaccine suppliers, the vaccine contain, first of all, is RNA, it's MRA encoded, 
the critical the component, like I mentioned earlier on the slides, which is coronavirus S protein. It's the same thing for Moderna and Pfizer with a small tweak on their MIs. For the liposomes, the basic lipid, the key thing is cholesterol. It's a fat, okay, similar with a little bit difference. Salt inside the particle, they also contain salt. With the different company resources, they have a different one. Some have a sodium acetate for the Moderna. For Pfizer, they have a sodium chloride, which is more familiar with us. Basically, day to basis, we need to consume that. And also contain some of the sugar, sucrose. In this category, they are the same. For both Moderna and Pfizer, in the phase three clinical trial, they achieve amazing protection efficacy, which is for Moderna is 94%, and for Pfizer is 95, which is unprecedented protection efficacy to protecting the uh, symptomatic COVID-19 cases. But here's a question. This is in highly controlled clinical trial test. So how's the reality in life? I would like to share with you about this graph for the happening that's happening right now in Israel. So why I choose Israel for the field is because there's a reason too. One, Israel is one of the country achieves the highest vaccine population. Second, Israel, they use a similar vaccine component as here in the States, for example, Pfizer. So let me walk through with the slides. So in the orange, which is daily new confirmed COVID cases, in the bluish, which is a vaccine in population number, since last end of the last year, with the increase of the number of the vaccine dose in their population, as you can see, and dramatically change comparison that is a decrease in the confirmed COVID-19. I'm pretty sure the slides will show speak for the purpose vaccine indeed play a central or important role in maintaining the COVID-19 cases in Israel. So with this, I sum up with my introduction for the commercial part of the COVID-19 vaccines. And what's next for our vaccine? for the scientists working on the new uh, vaccine for COVID-19. Yes, scientists still uh, develop the different uh, new approaches. I here, I would like to share with you one of the approach in our lab we're trying to develop in is, we try to use figure out a way to enhance immunogenicity of SARS-2 uh, S protein. In the wild type situation, the S protein can induce immune responses but in a small scale level. And using a new technique called unnatural amnesia, which is, think about it's a natural amnesia with certain modification, naturally it never exists. So we can precisely insert in this unnatural amnesia into the S protein. It has been shown the unnatural amnesia can increase immunogenicity of some other proteins. So we highly expect this approach can dramatically increase the immunogenicity of S protein. This will provide a new line of the vaccine tool to help us to fight of the potential emerging variant or other virus, uh, coronaviruses, SARS-2. So with that, I finished my, uh, till the end of my talk. And with that, I would like to close my talk with uh, one slide to thank my member of my group and my collaborator, and also my funding agents. First, first, it's my group of the members with this picture taking uh, 2019. This first one, Bo Xiao, is actually a graduate student from Ji Kui Song. He was formerly closely interact with us, collaborate with our group, so associate with us. Right now, he already graduated, move on to his uh, postdoc training in Vincent's group. Jerry, He's uh, studied some uh, influenza viruses in the chronic uh, disease condition. For example, smoking. Trevor is by the time is a <clears throat> rotation student. Dr. Paul Ryder is a 
visiting scholar from LSU and is working on HSV based on influenza vaccine. Noah Ryder is a doctor and is our next next generation of virologist. Harrison, you just mentioned earlier, is study uh, unnatural amino acid modification of the different viral proteins. Stephanie is the my first graduate student. He just she graduated last year, in uh, already now move on to a uh, top lab. Uh, Christopher Doblev in uh, Montreal study uh, T cell development. So with this new uh, last year, we also welcome some uh, new members joining our lab. One is Dr. Duo Xu and Amon and Katie. Okay. So for my collaborator, um, I was uh, post trained in Icon School uh, Mount Sinai, so I still. Uh, keep a close contact or collaboration with some members in the department. Peter is my advisor, postdoc advisor and my mentor. So we have uh, multiple different uh, collaboration in influenza vaccine uh, studies. Adolfo is studies in Zika viruses. And also- Wrong, th this, is, this is absolutely fascinating, Wrong. I think we're gonna have to go on to the, can you show your, la your, your last slide, please? Okay, so yeah. with this, I will also last to introduce, explain DOD, NIH, and uh, UC Reds of the funding agency. As a last slide, I would like to give a special shout out for the great, fantastic virology team in our CNES college and for the student or potential student I welcome you to join uh, uh, CNS, and I would like to pass on the to my colleague and a friend, uh, Morrison, or her uh, interesting story. After that, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ron. Thanks. Juliet, take it away. Right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for the intro, Ron. Um, today, I will be explaining how vaccines elicit immunity against SARS-CoV-2. So, I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay. All right. So SARS-CoV-2 is the causative agent of COVID-19 and it is transmitted by aerosols. So the virus is, uh, will enter the respiratory tract where it attaches to ciliated epithelial cells lining the sinuses and airways. And what I mean by ciliated epithelial cells is that these are cells that have cilia and cilia are these tiny cell protrusions shown here that can, that are responsible for moving mucus and for any trapped foreign substances upwards in the respiratory tract so that we are able to actually cough it up or potentially swallow these invading particles. When an epithelial cell becomes heavily infected, it becomes covered in viral particles as they bud from the surface. And so here I'm showing you an epithelial cell colored in green and all of these little blue spots here are actually SARS-CoV-2 trying to bud away from the, the cell. On closer inspection, SARS-CoV-2 is covered in spike proteins um, as um, Professor Hai mentioned and these spike proteins are shown in red. Spike proteins can bind a cell membrane protein called ACE2 receptor, and that binding allows the SARS-CoV-2 to enter cells and replicate. When SARS-CoV-2 enters the lung, it will end up in the alveoli, which are the deepest compartment of the lung and where our gas exchange occurs. So this is where you know, we um, get we oxygenate our blood. When viruses replicate in the epithelial cells and begin to kill them, the epithelial cells respond by producing something called cytokines. And cytokines are actually proteins that cells use to communicate with each other. In this case, the cells are infected and they are sending a signal to white blood cells to come to the site of infection in the lungs to come and fight the, um, to kill infected cells and to kill um, the viruses. So these white blood cells will come to the site of infection and they'll release more cytokines. 
And in fact, the fever and aches that we feel during infection are actually, or, or even sometimes during certain vaccinations, are actually due to these inflammatory cytokines. Normally, once the white blood cells come and release cytokines that then recruit other, cytok um, other white blood cells, we end up with the, uh, a resolution of the infection because the infection is then cleared. However, in the case of uh, severe COVID-19, we end up with this dysregulated feed forward loop where the white blood cells will release cytokines, cytokines attract more white blood cells, which release more cytokines, which attract more white blood cells. And this dysregulated <laughs> yeah. mechanism um, is called a cytokine storm. So the cytokine storm results in vascular leakage and tissue damage. And this is called acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. And I'm pretty sure many of you have heard about this before. This results in the accumulation of fluid in the lungs as depicted here, so that air exchange is compromised. And basically what that means is that you basically drown from the inside out. And so we want to have vaccinations occurring so that we can prevent this from happening. So vaccinations allow us to induce a strong immune response that is not dysregulated and that will not be highly inflammatory and will instead prevent us from getting the severe manifestations of COVID-19. So vaccinations um, typically induce both B cell and T cell responses. Uh, a B cell is a type of white blood cell that produces antibodies. And this is, um, vaccines are important for in the induction of functional antibodies. This is a depiction of an antibody. It's a Y-shaped molecule with these points that can bind to antigen, AKA foreign um, epitopes on proteins. We have many different types of B cells that are different, that are specific for different um, antigens. But let's imagine that we have a B cell here that can recognize spike protein. So when the B cell receptor binds to the spike protein um, and recognizes it as its complementary antigen, it is activated with the help of uh, helper T cells to rapidly multiply and produce tons of antibodies. And these antibodies can then bind to the, the spike protein on SARS-CoV-2, thereby preventing it from binding to the ACE2 receptor and getting into cells. So antibodies can prevent the infection of our cells. Our B cells and T cell responses also ensure that we have something called immune memory, which I will explain now. So let's look at this graph here. On our y-axis, we have the, num the amount of antibodies, and this is a log scale. And on the x-axis, we have time in days. And here we have a B cell. So the first time the body sees SARS-CoV-2, it doesn't have any specific uh, uh, memory against SARS-CoV-2. And so it takes a, a while, about 14 days, before B cells become activated and um, can um, produce the antibodies that can clear the infection. And after the infection is cleared, a small population remains of B cells, and these are called memory B cells. And what they do is to produce a low level of antibodies, but their primary goal, um, role in this situation is that if the, you get infected a second time with SARS-CoV-2, they can robustly respond very quickly and um, very strongly to replicate, um, to to expand our populations and then to produce a ton of antibodies. And so you can clear the infection very, very quickly, the secondary infection, without you even recognizing that you've gotten sick. And so here I'm showing you again how the antibodies work to prevent the binding of the virus to the host cell. And vaccination or the aim of vaccination is actually, actually to mimic a first time viral infection. So a vaccine mimics a first time infection. So when you deliver a vaccine to a patient, the patient reacts by expanding their B cell population and producing lots of antibodies. 
and most importantly, the formation of these memory B cells so that if you then become infected with SARS-CoV-2, you have this robust and very quick response where we'll have tons of antibodies being produced that will clear the infection without you ever recognizing that you were even infected. So this is what a vaccine does. In the context of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine where we have two doses, it does a, a very similar thing. So the first vaccine dose elicits a certain level of antibodies and immune memory. And then the second vaccine dose will boost that up so that we have even greater levels of antibody and even stronger immune memory so that if you do get infected with SARS-CoV-2, your immune system is ready to go and your B cells can begin pumping out tons of antibodies so that you can clear the infection without any um, side effects and any downtime. In addition to our B cell immunity or antibody mediated immunity, we also have something called cellular immunity. And this is mediated by T cells and T cells are another type of um, white blood cell. So here we have an infected cell. Let's imagine that these um, variants here are SARS-CoV-2 and the infected cell will also have viral antigen on its surface. And so what occurs is that a B cell, specifically a cytotoxic B cell, T cell, sorry, will bind to this antigen on the surface of, of the infected cell, and it will become activated to release two types of molecules, perforins and granzymes. And what perforins do is to poke holes in the, the cell membrane of the infected cell, and then the granzymes are pumped into the cell, and these are toxins that actually tell the infected cell to commit suicide. So it's a very neat and tidy process where the cytotoxic T cells will induce these infected cells to die so that they can no longer replicate virus. And in fact, if we, this image here on the left is actually showing a cell that is undergoing this programmed cell death or also known as apoptosis. And we can tell that this is programmed cell death because of these little protrusions on, on the surface of the cell which we in the scientific community call blebs. So blebbing means that the cell is undergoing programmed cell death to prevent the spread of the virus. And like B cells, T cells can also become memory cells. So if we were to um, change our graph to now look at T cell responses on our Y axis, we could say that a vaccine, as we know before, mimics a first time infection. So it will be activating T cells. Some of these T cells will become memory T cells so that when SARS-CoV-2 comes along and infects, these T memory T cells can immediately respond by expanding their populations and then going to the site of infection to kill the um, infected cells. And Basically, the overall goal of vaccination then is to build immune memory via our B cells and our T cells so that when we do get infected, we can clear an infection without getting sick so that we don't end up with those severe complications that you see in um, severe COVID-19 cases and we don't end up with um, death. And ultimately, that is what we want from a successful vaccination. So finally, I'd like to acknowledge the members of my lab, James, Sharon, Erica, and Roxana, as well as my collaborators um, from the St. John Lab, the Nair Lab, and the Laurent Roll Lab at, um, across the globe, actually. Um, my contact information is here, as well as my Twitter handle. And um, that's it for, for now, thank you. Thank you, Juliet and Rong. That was absolutely fascinating. We have a ton of really great questions coming into the chat. Um, while I get those organized, I want to ask the first question to Juliet. Uh, one of the things we've seen in the chat is what about the variants? Are the vaccines going to work against the variants? 
uh, uh, thank you for that, Francie. I, um, I actually have slides prepared for that. Um, so this here is um, a graph showing that, uh, at least in California, we are see we've seen this like rapid increase in the number of cases of the variant uh, B117. And as we've, uh, as the origin, as infections with the original strain decreases, shown here in red, we're actually seeing an increase um, in the number of case of different variants of concern. So what does that mean for vaccine efficacy? Well, let's imagine a spike protein. So this here in yellow would be our spike protein. And the spike protein actually has multiple epitopes uh, from where our antibodies can bind to. So let's say that there are 10 epitopes here and all of these different antibodies can bind to these 10 epitopes. Now, if we end up with a variant spike protein, you might have one or two changes that will prevent one or two of these antibodies from binding, but the other um, antibody binding sites have not been compromised, meaning that we can still get the, um, we can, the antibodies are still effective enough that we can still block entry of the SARS-CoV-2 into cells. Um, so currently the data are showing that the vaccines that we have right now and the, the responses that they induce are effective against the current variants of concern. However, in the future, it is possible that other variants may arise that could escape the vaccine mediated antibody response and allow for breakthrough infections. And in that case, we'd probably need additional vaccines to boost against the particular variant that will boost our immune systems uh, to allow us to be protected against newer emerging um, SARS-CoV-2 variants. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Morrison. That makes a lot of sense. We're gonna go to our first student ambassador, Min Chow, and she's gonna ask a, a question that um, she's been dying to ask. Hello, uh, my name is Min. I'm a uh, fourth year physics major, and I was really curious on the uh, mRNA technology. Uh, so I was wondering why is it, uh, even though Pfizer and Moderna are both based on the uh, same mRNA, mRNA technology, why is it that the Pfizer vaccine needs to be at a uh, temperature where the Moderna one is not? Okay, so Min, you dropped off a little bit there, um, but I think what he was saying is, a Pfizer and Moderna are both made on the mRNA technology. And so why do the Pfizer vaccines have to be at a much colder temperature than the Moderna ones? Yeah. Exactly. So that, I think this question is for, for Dr. High. Okay, yeah. So let me get a try. So for the Moderna and the Pfizer, even though they are both mRNA-based vaccine, as you can see that, that vaccine is actually have a, much more than MRA, just to say. First of all, the MRA is modified in a different way. Second of all, the MRA are both wrapped up with a lip liposome, nanoparticle. With inside the component, it could be contribute of certain degree of the variation. That's why they have the different temperature to be uh, preserved. And also the second is, all this observation is based on the fail uh, stress test from the different company. Okay, so. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Hai. Um, while we're waiting for uh, one of the other student ambassadors to get ready, I'm gonna ask one of the questions from the audience. And that is, how long does the spike protein last in human cells? So we get that you inject the RNA in the vaccine, the RNA is made into protein, the RNA, as we know, does not incorporate into the genome, so it's not a long-term effect, but is there any evidence of how long that spike protein is expressed in the cells? So maybe Dr. Morrison, do you wanna give that one a, a, a shot? Uh, sure, I can't give you the exact um, amount of time that it would um, stay in the cell, but the truth is proteins, there's a, a turnover rate for proteins our proteins, as well as foreign proteins within the cell, we have a system called the, the um, pro proteasomal mediated degradation, which means that anything that is, we are constantly 
turning over the um, proteins within our cell, which means that once the messenger RNA gets into the cell and is actually degraded and the proteins are made, those proteins are not going to be around for a very long time. They'll, we'll actually chop them up to, pre in our, so the way that antigen present, pre pre antigen present, presenting cells actually will degrade these um, proteins and present them on the surface of their cells to actually activate our T cells and B cells. And so though the spike proteins, you don't have to worry. They're not just going to stick around in our cells at all. They will eventually be um, chopped up and used for immune purposes to, to um, mount an immune response against the actual proteins. That's great. That's really reassuring. Uh, do we have our second student, Andrea Delgado, ready? Andrea? Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Andrea. I'm a second year environmental science major. And I just wanted to ask, so there was a lot of discussion on the Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J &J vaccines. So. Um, why do the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines need two shots and then the J&J &J vaccine is only one shot? So Dr. Hyde, you want to answer that? Yeah, let me give a, answer the question. So that's a good question. That's actually about the vaccine platform, right? So as I described this kind of table of the vaccine, it's actually in our vaccine field, we uh, can separate the vaccine to uh, one is a replicated one, one is an inactivated one, or subunit one. MRA, based on its uh, self, is still considered an uh, inactivated or subunit one. Okay, so it's not replicating itself, bad to say, MRA. So that's why usually, generally, for the inactivated vaccine to achieve optimal protection, we usually will give twice. Okay, twice. That's why it's a boost. However, for the JJ John Johnson Johnson antivirus based vaccine, which is uh, sort of like um, attenuate like antiviruses. So by itself, it can replicate in certain levels, certain degree. That's actually one shot. Well, usually it's a guide for the field. And based on the result, one shots already deliver pretty potent protection efficacy. Hopefully address your Thank you very much. Um, our third student, Aya Serhan, has another question. Aya? Hello, my name is Aya Serhan and I'm a third year biochemistry major. So we've heard a lot about herd immunity, but it's not clear exactly what that means. Would you mind explaining that a little bit further? Uh, so this, I think, will go to you, Dr. Morrison. Sure, I can take this one. Um, so the important thing to note before we even before I even get into more of an answer is that viruses can only replicate when they're in their host. So they're dead if they're not in the host. And so if enough people are immune to an infection, then the virus cannot be transmitted to new susceptible hosts and will therefore be eliminated from the population like, like, like um, smallpox has been. So the, the idea is that when enough people in the population are immune to this infection, the virus is unable to circulate and then the, pop, the population has reached what we call herd immunity. So that is what herd immunity is, the level of protection in the population that um, the level of response in the population that prevents further spread or replication of the virus. And currently the, the um, estimates for reaching herd immunity for SARS-CoV-2, I think are between 60 and 80% of people being immune. Although that might change with the variants which are a little bit more um, transmissible. So that might actually go up to maybe like 85% or 90. Okay, th thank you very much. We have another question from a student. Um, this would be Saba. Hello, uh, thank you for taking my question. I'm a third year biology major here in, within CNAS. And my question is, how long after contracting COVID do um, people need to take the vaccine? Or is it even recommended to take the vaccine? And you know, which one should they take? Is there like a preference? Um, is there really a difference between, I guess, the three? 
That, that's a great question. Dr. Hyde, you want to answer that? How long after you've had COVID should you get the vaccine? How long should you wait before you get the vaccine? Because you still should definitely get it. But okay, any yeah. recommendations there? I think the first question will already be addressed by, uh, <laughs> by Francie. It's uh, yes, it's recommended. You should take the vaccine even though you got uh, infected. So there's a reason because there's a paper find out infection to not give you a variable uh, protection by Denmark group. That's why vaccine is actually giving much higher protection efficacy. That's why it's the reason. And in terms of how long, I remember it's a 60 to 90 days or 90 days. So something about that. Yeah, that's a very opportune the day we set. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hai, that's great. So I have another question from the audience. There's a ton of them coming in. One question is, is could one make a vaccine, an RNA-based vaccine on multiple variants at the same time? So I guess the idea would be in your liposomal particle, particle you'd have multiple RNAs, each one maybe for a different variant. So I don't know, Dr. Morrison or Dr. High, who would like to tackle that question? It's a great question. Yeah, it is. I actually, I don't, I think that could be absolutely possible, actually. I mean, I'm thinking about how we, um, the vaccines for influenza, where we actually mix in um, different strains um, so that the vaccine is actually mounting an immune response to, you know, three or four circulating strains in the, um, of influenza. So I, I can, I can imagine that this would also work quite well for the um, lipid nanoparticle vaccines as well. So, so as a follow-up question, I, I assume that in each lipo nanoparticle, there's going to be multiple molecules of RNA. So in each particle, you could have, you know, 10 different variants if you wanted. Potentially. Yeah. Okay. Great. To um, add on this question, the uh, answer is that that actually it's an intensively uh, effort has been developed in the vaccine field. It's tried to develop a so-called uh, broad neutralization COVID-2 uh, vaccine, just like a universal flu vaccine. Basically towards, instead of this kind of change of the area, because some certain area of the S protein, which is highly conserved, it's limited. For example, like uh, RDB uh, domain, which can be choose or has been tested intensively actually right now to use that as a target. Okay, the next uh, question uh, from student Andrew Nguyen. Are you ready, Andrew? Yes, uh, hello, my name is Andrew. I'm a second year microbiology major. And my question for you guys today is, can the different vaccines be mixed? If I get the Moderna shot first, can I get the Pfizer as a second shot? Oh, that, that's a great question. Dr. Morrison, would you like to answer that? Sure. Yeah, that, that is a really good question. And people have been, a lot of people have been asking this, especially with, you know, the limits to our vaccine rollout. Uh, since the clinical trials for these vaccines use the same vaccine for each shot, I think it's best to follow the specifications of these vaccines, which is to have Moderna, then Moderna, or Pfizer, then Pfizer. That being said, from a biological standpoint, they should be almost identical in the responses they elicit. So if a person has issues getting a second dose that matches their first, um, theoretically, um, since they generate a similar immune response, I would say go for it. Um, however, we don't have studies showing that right now, but studies are now ongoing to test this concept in the clinic. But theoretically, um, Moderna followed by Pfizer, Pfizer followed by Moderna really shouldn't make that much of a difference. Oh, th thank you for that answer. That's really reassuring in case you lose your vaccine card, right? Um, we have another question um, from Ginny, a student, Ginny Winters. Hi, my name is Ginny Winters and I'm a third year general geology major. And I had a question about how some recent reports suggest that some long haulers, um, individuals who haven't yet just recovered fully, uh, have their symptoms go away after getting the vaccine. And I wanted to know how does that work? Okay, uh, yeah, I, I'll take this one. I've been thinking about this one a, a lot, actually. So currently the reason is unknown. Um, people are investigating it because it's really interesting. But I think one possible explanation could be that perhaps the people who are long haulers and the ones who did benefit from getting that vaccine, that they, were, they had never actually cleared their initial SARS-CoV-2 
to infection because they had probably not had a strong enough immune response. Maybe they didn't produce enough antibodies initially. And so vaccination can, um, would have prompted the production of much more antibodies that could have then cleared this persistent SARS-CoV-2 infection. Because as Ron mentioned, um, papers are now showing that the protection that you get from the vaccine is actually much better than the variable um, protection that you get from actually recovering from an infection. So it's quite possible that this vaccination um, helps the long haulers because it's actually helping them to clear uh, a low level persistence SARS-CoV-2 infection. But this is just one possible explanation and um, people are actively investigating this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morrison. That's really, really encouraging. Uh, we have another question from the audience about why are the vaccines more effective than the natural infection? Um, because if it's recommended that you've already had SARS-CoV-2, you should still get the vaccine. And so why is that? So we'll give this to Dr. High, I think. That's actually a very interesting question. I tell you the truth is uh, for the vaccine uh, document, okay, vaccine field document, the best vaccine you can get is actually actual infection. However, based on some reports, for example, like I mentioned, the like Denmark group, they mentioned that the infection actually gave a variable uh, protection per se. One possibility is could be the nature of this particular SARS-2 viruses. Second, it could be the inoculation, the infection could be variable. Some of them people could be a minimal amount of the contact, contact with, contract with a COVID virus. So in that way, in those people do not develop efficient efficacy, immune responses, that's why. However, in vaccine setting, we give you a standard immunity. In this way, we can generate controllable or predictable protection immune responses. That's why. Okay, thank you very much. We have another question from the audience. Um, uh, what's the latest on whether or not someone who's been vaccinated, whether or not they can actually still get infected and carry it even though they're not getting sick? And there's a lot of conversation behind this as to why people who are vaccinated should still be wearing masks. So Dr. Morrison, I'll, I'll give that one to you. Okay, so as I had shown you with those um, immune memory um, graphs, um, so having the uh, robust immune response to the infection doesn't mean that you weren't infected at all. So that's the, that's the kind of delicate um, difference there. You can, you can get infected once, even when you're vaccinated, but you, your body will tell you that you're not sick. So you, you'll probably get very, very mild symptoms or be asymptomatic completely. But that doesn't mean that you don't actually have virus replicating at a low level in your um, respiratory tract and therefore would be, wouldn't be able to transmit that to other people. However, studies coming out um, recently and currently right now are showing that, um, they're, that people who have been vaccinated are less likely to shed virus. So they are much less likely, probably like 80% less li or 90 to, to, to transmit virus to other people, but it, there's always that 10 or 20%. So that's why it's important to continue um, protecting, continue wearing masks so that you don't um, inadvertently bring SARS to an unvaccinated person. The, the, it's very unlikely, but the likelihood is still there. And then that's why it's so important to reach that herd immunity so we don't have to, we don't have to worry about that. Exactly. Um, here's another question um, that I've gotten from a lot of friends and family who've gotten the vaccine. We all sort of um, share our stories. How, much of, uh, how many symptoms do you have after your vaccine? Um, and is there any connection with how good of an immune response you mounted uh, relative to the amount of side effects, fevers, chills, or whatever that you feel after the vaccination. Uh, Dr. High, I'll throw that one to you. Can you repeat the question? So if you have a lot of side effects after the vaccination, yeah. are you, is, your, is your immune system mounting a better response than if you have no side effects at all? <laughs> uh, that's actually not true at all. It's a side effect is one of the side effects is coming from the vaccine. It has some indication about immune responses, but whether that have directly correlation to the right immune responses 
I mean, the right immune responses means the immune responses targeted on the viruses have certain correlation between these two. We still need to wait for more data to uh, prove that, to support that. Okay. And the current idea is no, it's just a side effect, unfortunately, associated with certain vaccine uh, platform. Okay. Thank you very much. That's encouraging. I had a friend call me the other day with that question. Um, there's been questions about how is this RNA technology going to uh, be in our toolkit, so to speak, going forward? So we understand these RNA vaccines are, are new. This is the first time they've really been used in humans, as far as I understand. Uh, they're very versatile. We talked about how you could make up new RNAs to new variants in a very short period of time. Um, what about uh, using this RNA technology for other types of vaccinations against other diseases, even cancer? Uh, what do you think about that, Dr. Morrison? Oh, I think, and also other, and also just other vaccines. Are we going to be using RNA technology for flu vaccines in the future? Uh, certainly, the companies. I think Pfizer has already started de designing one, and for flu, and many other companies have jumped on the bandwagon. I think we were nobody expected that these mRNA vaccines would have been so effective. I mean, ninety-five percent um, is amazing. The current flu vaccines that we have are you know, 50% if you're lucky. I mean, 60% if you're extra lucky um, at effectiveness. So I think moving forward, um, people definitely be trying to use these mRNA va vaccines for other um, viral diseases, as well as for cancers, because they have proven to be so effective against SARS-CoV-2. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's about time to, to get close to wrapping up. I wanna give you guys just one number. We've had lots of numbers over, over the past year, the number of cases, the number of deaths. That one number is 190 million. There's been 190 million vaccinations given in the United States as of today. And while I was preparing my concluding remarks on Saturday, that number was 179 million. And now it's 190 million, three days, 11 million extra people. So this is absolutely fabulous. Um, I want to also have a call out, a shout out for the role that basic research has played in developing these vaccines. This has been absolutely unprecedented. In less than a year, we've had great vaccines, but it was also growing upon all the research that, that, that all the work that researchers did in the past. Developing new knowledge and disseminating new, new knowledge is what we do in CNAS here every day. And we disseminate that knowledge to our students and to you, the public. So we want to thank you all for attending tonight's science lecture series. We want to encourage you to go to the to come to the next one, April 20th, where we'll be talking about understanding coronavirus assembly, a crucial step towards destroying the enemy. It'll be the same time, um, uh, five o'clock on April 20th. So thank you so much, everybody. This has been absolutely exciting. The questions were absolutely fabulous. I was trying to think of what people would ask and you guys came up with even better questions. So um, I hope you enjoy your evening and I hope you will join us next week on April 20th. And thank you again, Drs. Morrison and Hai for absolutely fabulous presentations. I now feel like I'm an, a real immunologist. Thank you all. Thank you, Francie. Thank you. Everybody, thank you. Thank you.